Christmas music that day. <laughs> and everybody around him was going looking there, going. There. <laughs> White Christmas is the Christmas song of the United States. It was originally recorded by Bing Crosby back in 1942, and it became so popular that it had to be re-recorded in 1947 because the masters became so worn that they couldn't be used. <coughs> the song's popularity had a lot to do with the fact that America had just gone to war. The American people found themselves in a confusing and an unstable world. Loved ones were being shipped off to the battlefront, not knowing if they would ever see their families again. And so this song had a powerful impact on American soldiers. They dreamt of a white Christmas when they could come home again. And when that white Christmas came, all would be merry and bright. For centuries, the Jews had dreamed of their own white Christmas. For centuries, they had been given promises that predicted the coming of the Messiah. And that Messiah would bring salvation to God's people. He would offer forgiveness for their sins. And he would bring light and peace to those who were God's people. As a result of those promises, the Jews were looking forward to a time when life would be merry and bright again. The prophet Isaiah had predicted that when that day came, though your skins were like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they were red as crimson, they shall be like wool. <coughs> Through Isaiah, God had declared that there would be a white Christmas for his people. There would come a day when their lives would be cleansed as white as snow, and their lives would be changed forever. Our scripture reading this morning is from the first chapter of Luke, verses 57 through 79, and they're talking about the birth of John the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment he wrote, His name is John. <coughs> Immediately his mouth was open, and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Over the centuries, as the Jews watched for this Messiah, they waited and waited and waited. And they waited so long, they actually began to wonder if he was ever coming. They became a people so filled with despair that they were literally living in darkness and in the shadow of death. So when the angel appeared to Zechariah, Zechariah was initially skeptical. But when he fully understood the significance of his unborn son's life's ministry, he knew his son, the one we know as John the Baptist, was going to herald in this long-promised Messiah. As a result, God allowed Zechariah to make a prophecy not only about his son's ministry, but about this Messiah who was finally coming to change the lives of God's people. So, how was this Messiah going to change people's lives? Well, for one thing, Jesus came down from heaven to shine his light into the darkness of our souls. 
In John 8, verse 12, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And let's look again in Luke 1, verses 78 and 79. Zechariah tells us that because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. He was to shine on those living in the darkness. How did he accomplish that? How did Jesus shine light into our lives? Now, I realize there are several different ways to apply this, but it's occurred to me that part of what Jesus came to do was to declare to us a different way to look at life. In Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 20, Paul writes, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Without Christ, people live lives that are often darkened in their understanding. But once we come to know Christ, we think differently than the world does. In his teaching, Jesus told us that. The world looked at the law that declared, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And the people of the world thought to themselves, we can't murder, but it's okay to be bitter towards people who hurt you. But Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. The world would hear the command, do not commit adultery, and thought to themselves, it's okay to look, just don't touch. But Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Billy Graham often said, the first look is free. There's nothing you can do about that. But it's the second look that's the problem. The world will look at the biblical com command to those in authority that justice should, sh should show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand and foot for foot. And they would think to themselves, it's okay to seek personal revenge. But Jesus said, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, Leave him your cloak as well. Jesus was basically telling people, change how you look at life. Refuse to live lives filled with bitterness, lust, and selfishness. Don't behave like those whose hearts are darkened by these things. Live lives that reflect the light and peace that I want to create in you. Now there are people who believe that that was all Jesus came to do. They believe Jesus only came to teach us how to live. But Zechariah says, no, the Messiah had another task. Jesus came to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. You see, a lot of people have a warped view of salvation. They view salvation as a kind of do-it-yourself thing. A little after midnight on Christmas in 1988, a 19-year-old woman was driving through East Los Angeles and apparently fell asleep behind the wheel of her car. Her car was plunged through a guardrail of a bridge and was left dangling by its left rear wheel. For the next two and a half hours, 25 rescuers and concerned bystanders worked to pull her to safety. One of the firemen at the scene commented that in the midst of the rescue effort, she kept saying, I'll do it myself. Lots of folks are like that. They look at their sins like a balance sheet. Their sins have plunged them over the edge of the bridge of life. And they think if they just try a little bit harder, if they do just a few more good works, that their lives will be pulled back from the brink and they'll get to heaven. They basically tell themselves, I can do it myself. I don't need God or anyone else to help me. But the repeated message of the Bible is this. It just won't work that way. You can't be good enough to be good enough to please God. Heaven cannot be bought. It's a free gift from God. 
But people have a hard time accepting the idea that God would give them anything free. A preacher was trying to explain this to the congregation. He had placed a beautiful poinsettia up on the stage. And just before the sermon, the preacher pointed to the plant and explained that it was free to anyone. Someone snickered and said, where's the catch? No catch. It's free. No one moved. A college student asked, is it glued to the altar? Everyone laughed. And the preacher said, no, it's not glued to the altar. There are no strings attached. It's yours for the taking. Well, asked a young teenager, can I take it after the service? The preacher shook his head and said, no, you have to come and get it now. He was illustrating that today is the day of salvation. And finally, the woman the preacher had never seen before stood up in the back and quickly, as if she were afraid that she would change her mind, she walked up to the altar, picked up the plant, and said, I'll take it. As she returned to her seat carrying the free gift, the preacher launched into their text with enthusiasm of Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he went on to preach that the gift of God is eternal life. It's free. The preacher then wrote, when the service had ended and most of the people had gone home, the woman who claimed the, who claimed the poinsettia came to the platform where I was picking up my Bible to leave. Here, she held out her hand. This flower is too pretty to just take home for free. I couldn't do that with a clear conscience. The preacher looked down at the crumpled paper that she stuffed into his hand and it was a $10 bill. This woman could not accept the idea of anything being free from God. And yet it was and is. Salvation is a free gift from God. But it did come at a price. It didn't cost us anything. But it cost God everything. The knowledge of salvation must include the idea of our receiving forgiveness from God for our sins. Unless our sins are forgiven, we will not get into heaven. No matter how nice we might be, no matter how moral we may have lived, no matter how many little old ladies we've helped across the street, unless God removes our sins, we won't be allowed to come into his presence. God spent centuries teaching the people the need for sacrifices to bring forgiveness of sins. God's people sacrificed birds, sheep, goats, and cattle. And the implied message was, if you're to be forgiven, something has to die. The writer of Hebrews says it this way. The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. For us to receive forgiveness for our sins, something or someone had to die. And the prophet Isaiah had declared that this would be the fate of the Messiah. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, <laughs> smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The song White Christmas declared that a person's life could be changed by a chance winter storm. The Bible tells us that our lives could only be changed by the deliberate act of Jesus Christ. This world looks for satisfaction in all kinds of places. They look for it in their possessions, their relationships, parties, even in the kind of weather they enjoy, whether bright sunshine or white snow. But the problem is that all those solutions are short-lived. They all eventually melt away. Jesus warned us not to put our treasures in things where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Someone once observed, if our greatest need in life was pleasure, then God would have sent an entertainer. If our greatest need would have been money, then he would have sent a financial consultant. If our greatest need would have been for information, 
He would have sent an educator. But God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that our greatest need was forgiveness. And so he sent a Savior. But the satisfaction Jesus could offer us goes way beyond anything this world can offer. A man named John Mays shared this interesting story. I was on my honeymoon in the Bahamas when a man walked up to me and said, Would you like to buy some cocaine? You can tell everyone how much you really enjoyed the Bahamas. <laughs> After I said no and got over the shock of that man's boldness, I wondered how Jesus would have responded if someone came up to him selling drugs. Later that day, someone else came up to me selling drugs. And that gave me another chance to share Jesus with them in the most creative way. After he told me that he had the good stuff, I asked him, what have you got? Once he said cocaine, I said the following. Is that all you have? I'm disappointed. I was hoping you would have something better than that. You see, I've got the real thing. What I have is all natural, pure, and it's very powerful. And it makes me feel great all day and all night. And get this, it may be illegal in some countries, but not in this one, so you can't get arrested for having it. By this time, the man was very curious, and he asked me, what is this incredible stuff I was talking about? I said, I'm talking about having Jesus in your heart. It's awesome what he will do for you when you get him inside of you. No drug in all the world is as good as having Jesus in you. The man stopped smiling and got this real serious look on his face. And he said, I want what you have. How do I get it? That's the question the folks around us should be asking. I want what you have. How do I get it? The gift that God gave us and the person and deity of Jesus Christ should make such a difference in our lives that people notice. They should notice without us having to tell them in advance. Jesus came as a baby in the manger. But our salvation comes from his being the sacrificial lamb on Calvary's cross. We no longer have to keep a record of our wrongs and a list of rules that we have to obey. God gave us a gift that we did not deserve because we owed a debt that we could not pay. Are you dreaming of a white Christmas? Unless you're traveling, the weatherman is not cooperating around here this year. But there is a white Christmas to be had that no weatherman can predict. Think of what the landscape looks like around us when it's covered in snow. All the dead grass, the mud, the trash, and the junk laying alongside the road, it's all covered by a blanket of beautiful, unblemished, pure white snow. Thousands of years ago, prophets predicted by the inspiration of God that one was coming who could give us a white Christmas every year, regardless of weather patterns. Jesus Christ would take our sin, our dead grass, our mud, our trash, and our junk. He would take it with him to the cross and covered in his own blood, making us white as snow. How do we get that white Christmas? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Admit you're a sinner and repent of those sins. Be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins and live a faithful life for Jesus Christ. Then all your days will be merry and bright and all your Christmases will be white. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank, we thank you this morning for the precious gift of Jesus, the best that you had to give us. And Father, we thank you for his shed blood that covers all of our sins and gives us the opportunity for a white Christmas, not only every year, but every day. Father, we have no way to pay the, the debt of sin. The sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament had to keep re being repeated over and over and over again. But when your son came and took our sins on the cross with him, that was the last sacrifice that needed to be offered because his blood washed us white as snow. Father, I pray that if there's one here who has not accepted that sacrifice, who's not accepted that gift that you've given so many years ago, 
that today would be the day that they would accept you, accept the gift that you've offered of eternal life through your Son. Father, if there's one here today who's accepted that gift but but has fallen by the way somewhat, that they have that they've started to live a life for the world rather than for you, that today would be that day that they would accept you again, repent of those sins. Or maybe one here today would like to make First Christian Church their church home to join us in serving you and doing what you call us to do, make disciples for Jesus Christ. Whatever decision it is that needs to be made today, Lord, I pray that today would be that day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.